I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's January 12th, and we have a lot to talk about. If you're like me, you're probably more than happy to say goodbye to 2020. And while last year may have been the most challenging year that many of us have ever faced, there were still some accomplishments worth noting. Accomplishments that were focused on improving the quality of life for people living with MS. Joining me as my guest to talk about some of these changes for the better is Dr. Barbara Geyser. Dr. Geyser is an internationally recognized neurologist and award-winning educator. She's specialized in the care of people with multiple sclerosis since 1982. Dr. Geyser has received a dozen awards for excellence in education at the local, regional, and national level. and She's the author of over a hundred publications, including peer-reviewed research articles, reviews, textbooks, chapters, and abstracts. In fact, Dr. Geyser served as the editor of the Primer on Multiple Sclerosis. Now, that's the reference book that thousands of healthcare professionals rely on to better understand how to treat multiple sclerosis. But before we get to my conversation with Dr. Barbara Geyser, there are a few other things that you should know about. Yesterday, the National MS Society released its initial guidance about the COVID-19 vaccine for people living with MS. And the first thing I should point out is that their guidance is for the two mRNA or messenger RNA vaccines that have been approved for use in the United States. And that's the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. Now, there are different vaccines available in other countries, So this guidance may not apply to anyone living outside the U.S. Along with the guidance, the MS Society issued this overall statement about the COVID-19 vaccines, and I'll read it to you verbatim. Vaccination against COVID-19 is critical for public safety, and especially the safety of the most vulnerable among us. Get your vaccine as soon as it is available to you. If you have MS, Visit nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19 to learn the latest about COVID-19 vaccines and MS. So before we get into the guidance itself, the message is clear and it's worth repeating. Get your vaccine as soon as it is available to you. Now I know that many of you have been anxiously waiting for this guidance to be issued, so I'm going to read it verbatim. This is the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine guidance for people living with MS. People living with multiple sclerosis are seeking peace of mind on the safety and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines. In response, the Society convened a group of expert researchers and medical professionals to review the available science and make fact-based recommendations. We do not know how many people in the vaccine clinical trials had MS, so data on the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines in those with MS is not yet available. Our guidance is based on data from the general population in the vaccine clinical trials and data from studies of other vaccines in MS. Our guidance will be updated and become more detailed as more is learned from scientific studies of the vaccines. The guidance here applies to mRNA vaccines only. There are two mRNA vaccines authorized for use in the United States, Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech. As there are different vaccines available in other countries, this guidance may not apply to those living outside of the U.S. People with MS should get a COVID-19 vaccine. The science has shown us that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective. Like other medical decisions, the decision to get a vaccine is best made in partnership with your health care provider. Most people with relapsing and progressive forms of MS should be vaccinated. The risks of COVID-19 disease outweigh any potential risks from the vaccine. 
In addition, members of the same household and close contacts should also get a COVID-19 vaccine when available to decrease the impact of the virus. People with progressive MS, those who are older, those who have a higher level of physical disability, those with certain medical conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, heart and lung disease, and pregnancy, and black and Hispanic populations are among groups with the highest risk for hospitalization due to COVID-19. If you are at high risk, you should get the vaccine as soon as it becomes available to you. These COVID-19 vaccines require two doses. You need to get both doses for it to work. If you've had COVID-19 and recovered, you should also get the vaccine. We don't know how long someone is protected from getting COVID-19 again. The COVID-19 vaccines are safe for people with MS. The vaccines do not contain live virus and will not cause COVID-19 disease. The vaccines are not likely to trigger an MS relapse or to worsen your chronic MS symptoms. The risk of getting COVID-19 far outweighs any risk of having an MS relapse from the vaccine. The vaccines can cause side effects, including a fever. A fever can make your MS symptoms worse temporarily, but they should return to prior levels after the fever is gone. Even if you have side effects, it's important to get the second dose of the vaccine for it to be effective. The vaccines are safe to use with MS medications. Continue your disease-modifying therapy unless you are advised by your MS healthcare provider to stop or delay it. Stopping some DMTs abruptly can cause severe increase in disability with new lesions on MRI. Based on data from previous studies of other vaccines and DMTs, getting the COVID-19 vaccine while on any DMT is safe. Some DMTs may make the vaccine less effective, but it will still provide some protection. For those taking Kesimpta, Lemtrada, Mavenclad, Ocrevus, or Rituxan, you may need to coordinate the timing of your vaccine with the timing of your DMT dose. Work with your MS healthcare provider to determine the best schedule for you. We are in the process of developing considerations for providers to use when making these decisions with you. All of us have a personal responsibility to slow the spread of the pandemic and eliminate the virus as quickly as possible. The authorization of safe and effective vaccines for COVID-19 bring us one step closer to eliminating this pandemic. In addition to getting vaccinated, the science is settled that wearing a face mask, social distancing, and washing your hands are the best ways to slow the spread of the virus and should be continued even if you get a COVID-19 vaccine. Now, that is the guidance. I'll also let you know who the neurologists and experts were who were involved in developing this guidance. Dr. Nancy Sycott, who's the chair of the National MS Society's National Medical Advisory Committee. Dr. Brenda Banwell, who's the chair of the MS International Federation International Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. Dr. Amit Bar Orr from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Jorge Coriel from the Raul Correa Institute for Neurological Research in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Ann Cross from Washington University and Secretary of the Board of Governors of the Consortium of MS Centers. Dr. Jaime Imitola from the University of Connecticut, UConn Health. Dr. Dorlan Kimbrough from Duke University. Dr. Avindra Nath from the National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Dr. Scott Newsom, Johns Hopkins University and the President of the Board of Governors of the Consortium of MS Centers. Dr. Penny Smith from the University of Alberta in Canada. And Board Certified Nurse Practitioner and MS Certified Nurse, Rachel Stakem. That is the National MS Society's COVID-19 vaccine guidance for people living with MS. So just to sum up its main points, please get the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it's available to you. 
And by the way, the order of when that vaccine will become available to you is being determined by each state. People with progressive MS, people who are older, people with a higher level of physical disability, people with certain medical conditions including diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, heart and lung disease, and pregnancy, and black and Hispanic populations have all been shown to be at higher risk for hospitalization if they contract COVID-19. So if you're in one of these groups, then be sure to get the vaccine as soon as you can. These vaccines require two doses to be effective, so you need to get both doses. And if you've already had COVID-19 and you've recovered, you should still get vaccinated. The COVID-19 vaccines that have been approved do not contain live virus, so they're safe for people with MS. The vaccines aren't likely going to trigger a relapse or make your MS symptoms worse. They can cause side effects, including fever, and fever can make your MS symptoms worse temporarily, but once the fever's gone, your symptoms should return to their normal baseline levels. So even if you get a fever after you receive that first dose of the vaccine, you still need to get the second dose. Research on other vaccines and disease-modifying therapies indicates that getting the COVID-19 vaccine while on DMTs is safe. Unless your doctor advises you otherwise, you should continue your disease-modifying therapy. Now, if you're taking Qsimpta, Lemtrada, Mavenclad, Ocrevus, or Rituxan, you may need to coordinate the timing of your vaccine with the timing of your DMT dose. So you should work with your neurologist to determine the best schedule for you. And even if you've received the COVID-19 vaccine, the science is very clear. You still need to continue wearing a mask, social distancing, and washing your hands. If you're a regular Real Talk MS listener, I already know that you listen to science. And this is what the science is telling us. This is how we're going to move past this pandemic. I also want to remind you that this guidance will be updated and become more detailed as more is learned from scientific studies of the vaccines. So like everything else that science is continuing to uncover about COVID-19, all of this is taking place in real time. Now, if you have any questions or you want to share your thoughts on this guidance, you can email me at john, that's J-O-N, at realtalkms.com, or you can leave voicemail on our Real Talk MS listener hotline by calling area code 310-526-2283. Of course, I'll suggest you visit the MS Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash COVID-19 to stay updated and you'll find that link in today's show notes. One of the few positive takeaways from the COVID-19 pandemic has been the widespread use of telemedicine. We know that telemedicine is convenient, but some people wonder about the quality of care that someone living with MS actually receives through telemedicine. Well, That's just one of the topics we're going to get to in a moment when we meet my guest, Dr. Barbara Geiser. Dr. Barbara Geiser is a neurologist at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. She's an internationally recognized clinician and award-winning educator, specializing in the care of people with multiple sclerosis since 1982. Dr. Geiser has received a dozen awards for excellence in education at the local, regional, and national levels, and she's the author of over 100 publications, including peer-reviewed research articles, reviews, textbooks, chapters, and abstracts. In fact, she served as the editor of the Primer on Multiple Sclerosis. Now, that's the reference book that thousands of healthcare professionals rely on to better understand how to best treat multiple sclerosis. Dr. Geiser has conducted peer review research on exercise as a therapeutic modality and has served as a consultant for the National MS Society on several wellness, exercise, and nutrition related work groups. She's also been an investigator on several clinical trials of novel medications to treat MS. 
Dr. Geyser's been listed in Best Doctors in America every year since 2005. She received the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center Exceptional Physician Award in 2015, and in 2018, Dr. Geyser was honored by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society by her election to their Volunteer Hall of Fame. It pleases me to no end to add that in addition to her clinical, research, and educational activities, Dr. Geyser is an MS activist. She's advocated for legislation to address issues including lowering prescription drug prices and improving access to care at both the state and national level. And she's also a recipient of the American Academy of Neurology Palatucci Public Policy Fellowship. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Geyser. John, that's one of the most gracious introductions I've ever had. Thank you so much. I want you to know my mother would be very pleased. I'm delighted to be on the podcast with you. Well, you know, in baseball, when they run into that rare player who can bat, they can field, they can run fast, they can steal bases, they say they're a multi-tool player. And if they're a good multi-tool player, they're the baseball players that end up in the Hall of Fame. And I have to say that in my Neurology Hall of Fame, you are the leadoff player You're very kind. Thank you. I'm going to blush. So it's a good thing I'm not on camera. I guess we should get to the questions. (laughs) Well, you know, one of the byproducts of the pandemic has been the rapid adoption of telemedicine. It's allowed people living with MS to keep their appointments with their neurologists while still staying safe. And as broadband connectivity is brought into underserved communities, it has the potential to provide a means for patients in those communities to more easily access health care especially specialized health care. Those advantages really speak to the convenience of telemedicine. What about the efficacy? Does telemedicine deliver quality health care to people living with MS? That's a great question, and I really like the way you framed it. And uh, again, certainly one of the silver linings of this horrible pandemic, if there is any, is that more people have been able to have face-to-face visits and conversations with their health care providers. And as you pointed out, people uh, in areas where there may not be a local MS expert can certainly take uh, advantage of MS experts in other parts of the country. I think telemedicine uh, can certainly help people with MS Uh, talk about symptoms, review medications, get information uh, about uh, therapeutic strategies, get information about some of the lifestyle uh, things that we know are important. Um, There are a few limitations. We can't really do a full neurologic exam over telemedicine. We can get an idea. Um, On the other hand, as you say, telemedicine uh, uh, basically does away with geographic barriers. It allows MS expertise in areas where there may not be any. Um, It allows people to uh, have visits without uh, fear of infection. So I think it's a plus plus. There's research that certainly indicates that telemedicine reduces no-show visits. Um, It may improve things like medication compliance. So I think it's a win. And again, one of the, the few good things I think to come out of this pandemic is that I hope after the pandemic is over, we'll continue to see increased use to telemedicine and um, increased regulatory freedoms that allow us to do this. I hope you're right about that. And, you know, very few things in this world are all or nothing propositions. It sounds like this may be one of them. In other words, uh, telemedicine can be a real benefit to people living with MS. At the same time, in-person visits with their neurologist need to be a part of that total treatment equation. That's absolutely right. Um, I think that's a great way of putting it. You've published peer-reviewed research on the effect of exercise on people with MS, and you were part of the expert panel that recently published the National MS Society's Exercise Recommendations for People Living with MS. An important and, for some people, surprising aspect of those recommendations is that your group has recommended exercise for all people living with MS, including people with a higher level of disability. So can you tell me about these new recommendations? Sure. I'm I'm very excited to talk about this. I think um, there are a lot of things to know about this publication. First is that the task force uh, had a lot of breadth and depth to it. Uh, It had uh, physicians, exercise specialists, physiologists, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists. 
um, really a very broad representation of people with a lot of years of knowledge and expertise. The recommendations were a combination of evidence-based recommendations, meaning we went to the literature and if there was a trial uh, or something published about a particular exercise modality in a particular population of people with MS, we used that. Where there was not uh, evidence or literature to support a recommendation, we based it again based on the very broad clinical experience and expertise of the panel. Um, as you said, uh, one of the other things about this publication is certainly there are many, many, many years of publications about exercise for people with MS, but this was one of the very first that examined it along the whole spectrum of disability. Um, exercise is important for everybody. Exercise is important for um, people with MS. Exercise is important for everybody with MS, and especially, I think, for people on the more disabled end of the spectrum, because in those uh, persons, we're always concerned about preventing complications such as contractures, skin breakdown, bone loss, and exercise, pneumonias. And exercise can certainly help prevent those complications in addition to improving function and in addition to improving the way people feel. How do we get more neurologists to talk about exercise with their patients? That's a great question. Certainly, um, when I was training, which was a few hundred years ago, we didn't have any any particular training in, in uh, exercise for people with neurologic disease. And in fact, at that time, the conventional wisdom, and I put that in quotes, is that people with MS were told not to exercise. So thankfully, we've become more enlightened. Certainly, there uh, is, uh, again, a lot of information on the MS Society website. There are certainly professional conferences, the Consortium of MS Centers, the National, uh, the American Academy of Neurology, where presentations on exercise for people with MS and other neurologic disease uh, are presented. So I think the information is out there, um, and I know the MS Society helps get the word out to healthcare professionals. Well, I know you participate in MS research, but you also see patients at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute in Santa Monica, California. So I want to ask you about a subject that we continue to hear more and more about, at least conversationally, and that's the concept of shared decision-making. What does that mean? I think this is, goes fundamental to, to the heart of, of health care. And if you'll permit me a, a comment, um, as we know, um, uh, certainly women in, in medicine are not new, but for a long time, we were in the minority and, and a lot of medical care was rather paternalistic. Physicians tended to be male and patients were, were often put in a subordinate position. That is, they were not part of the decision-making process. And now, uh, again, over the past several decades, the model is that shared decision-making is vitally important for any uh, physician, healthcare provider, patient interaction. I think in the case of people with MS, because there are very few absolute right answers because there's a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity that goes into decision making about therapeutics and diagnosis and symptom management and lifestyle. I think that there has to be shared decision making. I think the physician's job is to help supply the patient with the most accurate and um, up to date and unbiased information they can have and then help the patient make the decision that's best for them. How should a patient bring up this conversation about shared decision-making with their neurologist or, or other treating physician if they feel that that may not be happening, that's not the kind of communication they're experiencing in that office? I would like to hope that, that any physician, any health care provider will certainly be uh, amenable to questions. And so uh, the person with MS might say, uh, if it's a physician, Dr. So-and-so, uh, I'd like to explore this particular subject further, or I have com some concerns about this particular medication, or um, maybe uh, I'd like to tell you some issues that I've been having. I think if you approach any healthcare provider uh, in a fairly straightforward manner, they, they will be able to include you in that part of the process. My listeners know that I'm an MS activist, and when I introduced you, it was really my pleasure to remind them that in addition to distinguishing yourself through your clinical 
your research and your educational activities, you also make time for advocacy. Uh, I'm hoping you can share why advocacy is important to you. Thank you very much. My, my advocacy activities have been among the, the most meaningful and, quite honestly, the, the most fun activities that, that I've done. I've had the opportunity to interact with our legislators, both in Congress and in Sacramento. And I think that the important part of advocacy um, is that it puts a human face on what legislators are are trying to help us with. The legislator may pe- may see a piece of legislation and they'll see facts and figures and numbers, but until they've spoken, in the case of MS, until they've spoken to a person with MS, until they've spoken to a healthcare provider, until they see how this affects constituents at an individual level, they may not get the full picture. And so advocacy is a way for us to bring the human face into the legislative venue, and it's very powerful. And conversely, I think it also helps us as as advocates and as non-legislators help us understand some of the challenges they're up against and some of the, the intricacies of the legislative process. Dr. Barbara Geiser, thank you for everything that you do every day to improve the lives of people living with MS. And thanks for talking with me today. Thanks for inviting me on the show, John, and thanks for all you do to help give people with MS accurate and up-to-date and practical information. I've been honored to be on your show. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 176. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. I don't think I have to tell anyone listening to this podcast that the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified and in some cases multiplied the challenges of living with MS. More than ever before, people living with MS need access to reliable information, support, and connection. We're witnessing that even during a pandemic, MS doesn't stop, and neither does a National MS Society. With vital funding from supporters like you, the National MS Society is continuing to meet the urgent and expanding needs of the MS community during these unprecedented times, while ensuring that the MS research community rebounds quickly from COVID-19, so that the progress and momentum toward finding a cure continues. And that's why I hope that as you're able, you'll make a donation to the Society's COVID-19 Response Fund. It couldn't be easier. Just text the word GIVE to 68686, and you'll get a link right to the MS Society's COVID-19 Response Fund webpage. I hope you'll consider contributing today, because it's never been more important. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.